Welcome back to the Chasing Happiness podcast, an honest podcast about finding happiness, what it really means, and the process of getting there. My name is Crystal, and today I'm going to have a wonderful conversation with Dr. Kevin Payne. And we're going to talk about a number of things because I have all kinds of questions. But before I get into any of the questions, because you all know I'm super excited, He is an author, a speaker, a podcaster, a teacher, a social psychologist, and the founder of Your Life Lived Well. But Kevin, before we actually get into the nitty gritty of what that is, what you do, and who you are, do you want to introduce yourself to everyone who's listening? Well, I'll try to live up up to that. Thank you for the enthusiasm, Crystal. Uh, Yes, uh, you've, you've hit a lot of the high points there. There are probably three quick things that people would want to know about me. One... Yeah, I'm egregiously overeducated. My doctorate's in sociology and psychology. I've studied people for the past 30 years. I spent 15 years of that as a professor. Uh, And the last decade, I've been a startup tech entrepreneur. And I build models that predict people and help us better understand who we are and where we're going and that sort of thing. Second thing about me is that I live with multiple sclerosis, and I first became symptomatic as a young man in college in 1989, and that kicked off a comedy of medical errors that lasted for quite some time. That is not unusual with MS at all, and I finally received a conclusive correct diagnosis in 2006, and so I have, have known that I've been living with MS for almost 16 years now, and that has greatly shaped my life. I, I have had a lot of ups and downs with MS, and during the time that I was getting diagnosed, I was also supporting a wife who was dealing with an advanced cancer. So I was living the joys of chronic illness, both from the diagnosed side and the caregiver side. And that led to my labor of love, which is your life lived well. And I'm sure we'll get into that as we go, but it's about trying to answer the question, how do we live well when we're stuck with something that's really bad that we can't get away from? And that's what we're living with because all of our strategies for making life better is to get away from the bad stuff. Right. But, but by definition, I am stuck with my MS locked in this carcass with me. And so that changes our calculus. And the third thing that people might want to know about me is yes, I am an enthusiastic skydiver. I I fling myself from airplanes miles in the air with glee and abandon, and uh, this is central to my story, so I'm sure we'll we'll get into it in some way, but I'm up over 600 jumps now, and, and I'm a comfortable denizen of the air. We will totally get into that because I have all kinds of questions because skydiving is something I want to try but haven't tried yet, but let's not start there because then I will off on a tangent and we will never get to the things that I'm sure the listeners want to know. And I want to start with this diagnosis of yours because MS is something here in Canada specifically, we have a really high rate of diagnosis of MS Mm -hmm. and there's still Mm -hmm. so much that is not understood about what it is, how it comes to be, how we can treat the symptoms, how we can treat it overall. So Mm -hmm. you struggled for years to even get your diagnosis how did you work through, especially back then, like technology is very different now than it was in the eighties and early nineties. How did mm-hmm. you eventually get through all of that? Like, what was that process like for you? Uh, stupidity and, and determination, I guess. Uh, so <clears throat> let's wind back to 1989. It's toward the end of the year. And I started having these weird symptoms. I started feeling really tired and for no reason. I started having what are called eye saccades, which are kind of like when your eyeball stutters and it, it vibrates back and forth real quick. And uh, there's, there's sometimes pain associated with it. And it's, it's just kind of a weird little experience. My 
balance started going wonky mm -hmm. on me. And, uh, and I, and uh, I started having parathesias, which are phantom feelings that aren't there. And so in my case, sometimes that was pain. Sometimes it felt like an electric shock, but most of the time it felt like itching. So I was constantly itching all over my body and you can't scratch it because it's not, there's right. nothing wrong on the skin. It's, it's damage deep in my neural system, but I didn't know that at that time. So I got down about this. This was, this was weird and it was unexplained and I got down about it and flash forward a couple of three months and I finally went to the university physician about this. And I think he fixated on what he expected to hear from a young person in a demanding academic program. And okay. he focused on the, oh, I'm feeling down about this part of it. And he said, you're depressed. And he referred me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, yes, you are uh, majorly depressed and here are some drugs. And so I'm a young man at this time. What do I know? And right. I was like, okay. And the drugs didn't work. And so they tried some other drugs and the drugs didn't work. And they tried some other drugs and the drugs didn't work. And so in their medical wisdom, they said, you are treatment resistant which of course is the medical establishment's way of saying we give up. Right. We have nothing we can do for you. And so a few months later, I felt back to normal again. And I went on with my life. And this is not unusual with relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. The symptoms come and go. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. And then a couple of years later, the weirdness was back and then it was gone. And then a few years after that, it was back again. And this time the symptoms were worse and I was cognitively foggy and didn't feel myself at all. And oddly enough, I, I, I got completely knocked off kilter and I truly was depressed. And I lost track of my normal personal habits, and I gained 120 pounds. Wow. And, and one morning then, I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I said, oh my gosh, I look like the guy who swallowed Kevin. And uh, I, I, I was seeing myself as I was in that moment for the first time in a couple of years. And I felt better again. And the symptoms weren't like that. So I went back and reclaimed and rebuilt my personal habits and lost 120 pounds and went back to my life. And then one morning in 2002, I woke up and I had a different symptom and I couldn't feel my left leg below my knee. Oh my God. It was just gone. No feeling. Now, Again, I'm, I'm still a young man. I'm in my 30s and, and I'm still armored in my illusion of invulnerability. Sure. And, and so my first thought was, oh, I probably pinched a nerve working out the day before. So I didn't think about it. And a few days later, my leg was back. And then it was gone again. And then it was back. And then it was different parts of my body. And then finally... One morning I woke up and I could feel my right arm and my head, but the rest of my body had disappeared. No wow. feeling. And at this point, after having witnessed this for many, many years, my then wife said, I'm putting my foot down. You're going to get this looked at. Mm -hmm. So I did. And <clears throat> my, my general practitioner uh, sent me on a neurological consult and I met with the neurologist and we did a bunch of wacky tests. And the first thing he said to me is, well, you will be glad to know that it is not multiple sclerosis. Wow. And I was like, 
dodged a bullet there because that was the biggest, baddest, ickiest possibility that they'd been floating from my symptoms. And then he said, but we've got this new MRI in the area. And remember, this is the early 2000s. Right. So he said, it's got a better resolution than anything we've ever had. So I want to go ahead and send you there and, and get some more data. So I'm like, sure. He said, if there is anything we discover from it, my office will contact you. Otherwise, come back in three months and we'll regroup and try something else. So I did the MRI. I didn't hear from his office. I thought about canceling the appointment because I'm not getting any information out of this. Sure. But I decided in the end to go. So he bustles in that morning with my now alarmingly thick file. And that tells you something about how long ago it was because it was a paper file. Paper and not file, yeah. Are. Yeah. <clears throat> so he sits down across from me and we exchange our pleasantries and he starts flipping through the file and he does a wild eyed double take at my file. Now, I can tell you, you never, ever want your neurologist to do a wild eyed double take at Panic your file. moment, yep. Yeah. And then he looked me in the eye and he said, excuse me, I've got to go check something. I'll be right back. And he whisked out of the room. So I'm left waiting during the longest five minutes of my life. And and he comes back in and he looks a little dejected and he slumps back across from me. And he looks up at me and says, I'm so sorry. Now, again, you never want your neurologist to start with, I'm so sorry, but did. And he said, there is no doubt under the better resolution that it is multiple sclerosis and you've got a lot of lesions. It's been in your system for a long time. So that was the bottom dropping out of my world moment, right? It, It is... A, a life-changing diagnosis. Suddenly, I am irrevocably a citizen of the world of the sick. Yeah. And that was something. And of course, you know, he explained to me, you know, what, what my prognosis was and all that. And, and, you know, at the time, they said, you should be prepared. You likely will not be walking in 10 years. Wow. And, and of course, that's, you know, far more than 10 years ago now. Um, but uh, that, was, that was a sobering thing. Oh, I'm sure. And, to be told in your 30s, not only do you have this thing, it's incurable. Oh, and by the way, if in 10 years you're walking, you're going to be like the 1% of the 1%. Like, I can't even fathom what that experience, especially in your 30s, would have been like because really speaking to someone who just entered their forties, you sort of walk through life at this stage with a, like, I'm, as you said, I'm invincible. Nothing's going to happen to me. I have so much of my life ahead of me. I cannot Mm -hmm. even fathom how you walked out of that office, let alone moved forward from there. Well, it was, it was on the one hand, a challenge and I was kind of gobsmacked about it. On the other hand, I was relieved because Now, at this point, I had an explanation Mm -hmm. that actually seemed to fit my experience. Sure. And and once I had that information, now I had a target. Now now I knew what I was going to be dealing with. And and that meant that I could I could plan, I could strategize, I could start being proactive rather than reactive. And and so all of that was really important. And and so you know, I will always say even if it's bad information, accurate information is always good because it's about our agency. It's about finding our agency in what we're doing. And if and if we don't know what's happening, then we're stuck being reactive. Yes. Well, so and, that was good. And and I would think, 
especially struggling for as many years as you did. Like, I just want to remind everyone who's listening. This is like before the internet, before we could hop on Google and just like ask what was going on, right? Like you well, actually back well, yeah, in the day. And, and, you know, Dr. Google is, is its own <laughs> set of problems. <laughs> exactly. Like it was a totally different world. So like for people who are listening now, who maybe weren't, you know, experiencing the world back in the 80s and early 90s, Like you had to walk into a library and get a book. Like that's how things worked. It wasn't like open your phone and suddenly all the answers are there. So, and I love books. I have more than 4,000 books in my personal library. So, oh, now I'm obsessed. Listen, anyone who listens to this podcast knows I'm a book person. So suddenly, absolutely, even just more in love with you as a human being now, because I want to have the Beauty and the Beast library. I don't want the the fairy tale. I just want the freaking library that she had. Um, Amen, sister. <laughs> that's, I'm totally 100% with you on that. I do want to ask you, though, because I know because I know people who do have MS, I know stress is a really big thing. You have to Mm -hmm. monitor your stress in order to sort of be ahead of your symptoms. And you have to be very self-aware of your own energy, your sleep habits, your everything. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to sort of find your rhythm once you had this diagnosis? Yeah, so this is a huge topic and it's one of my pet peeves. And so, yes, you are looking at somebody who you, you have MS and the first thing they tell you is avoid stress. Okay. And, and so what do I do? I take up one of the most stressful pastimes that you can possibly have flinging yourself at the earth at terminal (laughs) velocity repeatedly. And that actually is an important part of my coping mechanism. So I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that in a second. But let's go back to this idea of stress. I want to smack every well-meaning medical professional that tells us to avoid stress. Because life is stressful. We cannot avoid stress. Right. And we have this misunderstanding. And even medical professionals misunderstand what stress actually is and what it's doing. Because you have to realize that your typical medical professional only has two or three or four hours through all of their education of education about stress. That's it. That's because they've got a gazillion other things they need to learn. Right. So, So... there's a massive misunderstanding here. So if, if, if we go back to the origins of medical stress and how we understand it. So now we're back in the 1920s and we're about a hundred years ago. And in the first article that defined medical stress, he also defined two other terms, eustress and distress. Mm. And EU stress, EU stress, which EU is, you know, that epsilon is, is the Greek prefix for good. So this is good stress and distress is bad stress. All right. So <clears throat> when Canon is defining the acute stress response and, uh, you know, this is, this is foundational to the way we see medicine and and so many other areas today. Sure. Oh, what what he's doing is he's looking at how does your body respond to challenge? How does our brain respond to perceived challenge? Mm -hmm. Now, this is important because we all think we know what the fear response is. We, we, we think we know, yeah, it's like my heart races, my respiration becomes faster and more shallow, my, I start sweating, my, my blood pressure rises, my capillaries uh, you know, constrict, right. and, and all of those are, are responses to an immediate, acute, urgent, physical threat in our environment, Okay. Now, that's a great reaction to have if it's a saber-toothed tiger rustling in the underbrush. (laughs) Right. 
<clears throat> but it is not a reaction that is necessarily helpful for most of the challenges that, that we face today. Right. So that's the first thing we have to understand. We have to understand that this is about challenge. And what that means is that same physiological and, and cognitive and emotional response that our primal brain triggers, okay, it's sometimes called an amygdala hijacking, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> that is that is triggered when we feel like we are faced with a demand in front of us where the outcome is uncertain and we know we are going to have to deliver at a high level. And, and that is the same response that we have. And one way we, we frame it, we characterize it as fear, mm. but we take that same response and we frame it as excitement. We frame it as excitement when we are just getting to know somebody that we are interested in. We frame it as excitement when we are about to walk into an important meeting that we feel prepared for. We frame it as excitement when we are challenged in a way that allows us to demonstrate our capacity and our agency in the world, right? And that gives us what we call flow experiences, which is, you know, being in the zone, being, uh, you know, in, in this really cool place where we're, we're functioning and the world seems to slow down and our reflexes seem to get faster and our perception seems to expand. Right. And, and so what I'm saying is, if you tell people to avoid stress, you are telling them to avoid the edge. And the edge is the limits of the capacity that we can deliver right now. And what that means is, yeah, you're pulling us back from the potential of failing. But if you don't have the potential of failing, you never trigger growth. Right. And you never have these wonderful, beautiful, miraculous flow experiences that we all treasure. Right. So it's not about avoiding stress. It's about learning how to reframe stress. And and that. It's about understanding that this fear response that we so often frame it as is a choice mm -hmm. because <clears throat> now it's a choice that's normally being made by our basal brains. And so it's, it's a choice that is happening before our higher cognition is engaged. Right. So what we have to understand is that this fear response is not fight or flight. Okay. That's a little tiny version of it. There's a lot more going on there. It's really freeze, front, flight, fight, fawn, flock, fright, faint. Okay? <laughs> I know. There's a lot there <laughs> that I just said. And I call it the effort response. Because, because what it is, in a nutshell, is it's always about us trying to get distant from this potentially negative bad thing right. that we fear that we don't understand, that we think may be harmful or painful. Right. But again, what did I just say earlier on? I said most of the challenges we face now are not the kind of challenge that that response allows us to deal with. Right. Those are acute emergent threats that it allows us to deal with. What we deal with now are more often cognitive behavioral, social, sure. and they are ongoing challenges. They are chronic challenges. They are not necessarily things we can get away from, like my MS. Right. And, Sorry, and I just, I just kind of- No, just I absolutely it. love this. And I'm so glad you touched on this because one of my pet peeves is when people say, oh, well, just create a life that doesn't have any stress. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are in the world. I don't care how much money you make or what kind of life you're living. Everyone has stress, just like everyone has problems. It's just how you deal with them, how you're able to cope with them, what skills you have, what resources you have at your disposal. And I love that you touched on all of this because the fact that you skydive 
most people would be like, oh my God, that's so stressful. How can you put your body through that? But what you're saying to people is the level of excitement that is happening in your brain may be similar, but how you're viewing it, how you're processing what is happening is where that difference is. And really it is about that mindset, that framing of what you're going through or what you're experiencing or pushing towards. And I love that because One, it opens the door for us to talk about your skydiving, but two, it gives people who are listening to this podcast the ability to sit down and think, okay, the thing that's right in front of me that I am afraid of, that's stressing me out, that I'm worried about, is it really fear or is there something else going on here? And that's the question people should be asking themselves. Yeah. And and let me throw another uh, idea in here to to kind of muddy things up a little bit more. (laughs) And, and, And that is, so first of all, there is no thing in the world that is inherently fearful or joyful mm. or meaningful or whatever. Those sure. are all judgments that we make about that thing, about that experience, about that person, about that relationship, whatever right. it is. Those are all judgments that we make. And people say, oh, don't judge. Well, again, okay, this is another thing. If we did not judge, we would never move. We would be inert lumps on the couch and we would never move. The important thing to understand is you have many, many, many different independent brain systems that are making lots of different judgments. And judgments are all about moving us in particular directions. And what's important is not that you don't judge. What's important is that you insert a pause in the process so that your frontal brain can catch up Mm. and can say, okay, now I'm going to look at the bigger picture and I'm going to decide which ones of these judgments I'm going to act on. And that's different. Oh, I love that. So we have to understand, you know, that freeze part in that freeze front flight flight, you know, and all those options that's hypervigilance. That is something that we have to learn to understand. We learn to recognize the excitement in our in our body. We learn to understand that this physiological arousal is not in and of itself fear. Right. It's not in and of itself pain. It's not in and of itself anything, but your first clue that somewhere in your brain some system has said, oh, I don't understand what's going on here. It looks like it may be like something that I recognize from my experience that could be scary or harmful or uncertain, right? But now, if you learn to cultivate that pause, now you are giving your your better developed frontal lobes time to catch up right. because they operate slower than our basal brains. Right. And, and this is, you know, the key. And this is part of why I went back to skydiving because part of that was reclaiming a childhood dream because I wanted to be a skydiver from the time I was a kid. Aww. And I started the training the first time in the nineties and got a handful of jumps in and, That was, you know, a lot of fun and I loved it. But what I realized from that experience was becoming a legit skydiver is not a hobby. It's not a pastime. It requires a massive amount of time and commitment and it is a lifestyle choice. And because it's not, it's, it's not just jumping out of a plane. To get your first license in skydiving, it takes 25 jumps and your A ref card, you have over a hundred skills that you have to check off. Wow. Because you have to learn to pilot your body in the air. And you also have to learn to pilot a canopy mm. and land it safely on target. So that's a lot to deal with. And so in 2019, after I'd hit bottom, and I, I had realized uh, that it had been over a decade since I had done anything 
just for myself. I'd gotten so caught up in both the the demands of trying to negotiate my MS and the demands of a caregiver that I had completely lost all of my good habits. And I was at bottom and I was unsure that I was going to be able to find a way from the life I then had to any kind of life I was interested in living. Mm. So I decided to give myself one last chance and to do something just for myself. And the thing that I wanted was skydiving. I wanted to go back to skydiving. And I did it not just to reclaim that childhood dream, but also because the thing that I had come to fear most in the entire world was my own body. Wow. And and so logical me, I said, okay, if I'm skydiving, then I literally have to use my body to save myself right. every time. And that is a way that I can reclaim the natural confidence I used to have in the world. So wow. you've seen the the photo on the cover of my book. Yeah. It took us eight jumps over six weeks to get this. Oh exact my gosh. Photo. Because this photo not only tells the story of the book, it tells the story of everything I do. And so I wanted, you know, the beautiful sun on the horizon, the clouds and all of that. But think about this. I am at 5,000 feet when this picture is taken and I'm headed to the earth at 120 miles an hour. <laughs> Okay, so what that means is when this instant in time was frozen, I had 27 seconds left to live. Wow. If I do nothing at this point, my life will unequivocally end in 27 seconds. So what am I doing? I've got my hands up to my forehead like this, and I'm about to sweep them out in a broad gesture. And what does that mean? That's a gesture that every skydiver in the world will recognize. It's called the wave off. And what I am doing is I am warning everyone in my airspace that I am about to take action to save myself. I am actively choosing life in the face of certain death at this moment. So I wave off. And I deploy my parachute. And what I want people to understand is, yes, get out there and get all the support that you possibly can. And, and that's medical support and therapeutic support and coaches and everybody else. You know, get them into your tribe and, right. and get that support. However, you are still the bottleneck. And, and you must actively choose life. And so the beautiful thing I love about skydiving, because it is an amazingly relaxing, zen, focused, <laughs> mindful experience. Once you become at home sure. in the sky, right? Uh, but fear is inside the plane. When they open that door for the first time, your eyes get really big and the wind is swishing <laughs> through the plane and you're like, oh my gosh, that is a really long way down because generally we're about 14,000 feet when we jump out and, and fear is on the inside. But once you pass through that door, once you make that decision, there is joy. There is, there is joy at that edge and that edge is one of the two ways humans learn. We, we learn when we are at our edge and, and that is growth learning. And, and that's the trigger, but that's not where the actual learning and consolidation happens. We trigger it like working out, right? With the weights, you, you sure. take your muscles to failure, you trigger it at the edge, and then you have to take yourself back to your home and you have to take yourself back to a place 
where you can disengage that sympathetic nervous system and engage the parasympathetic nervous system and rest and relax and recover and sleep and nourish and consolidate and grow. And, and all of that is, is crucial. You've got to take care of yourself. Then you, then you are fortified and growth and you can go back out to the edge again. So we had that beautiful experience, but every skydive is in the stoic sense, a memento mori, a reminder. And, you know, the ancient Roman philosophers, uh, the Stoics, a memento mori is a reminder that we are always in the presence of death, that life is fleeting, that life is precious, that each moment will not pass our way again. And so in the edge of death, I choose life every time. And so in 2019, I went back, I got my A license, my B license, logged about 140 jumps. In 2020, I set myself a bigger goal. And I said, I'm going to become a legit skydiver. And what that means is passing 500 jumps, because 500 jumps is where you're eligible for all the licensing in the sport. You're eligible for professional ratings so that you can get jobs in the sport, that sort of thing. So I got my coach rating along the way. What that meant then in 2020 is if I were going to do that, I was going to have to jump a little better than one jump a day on average for the entire year. Wow. So in 2020, I logged 370 jumps, which for a middle-aged guy with a degenerative neurological condition is a pretty good clip. And what that means is every day on average, I was tripping my acute stress response and choosing life and managing it and taking myself back to my home and recovering and learning to do it again. So I was learning to, to make that fear, to make that edge my friend and to, and to develop my sense of competence and agency in the world, even though I lived with a body and a brain that had repeatedly betrayed me for many years. And, and so, yeah, skydiving is a, is a crucial part of my self-care. Now, you know, I also <laughs> meditate religiously and, uh, you know, diet and exercise and mindfulness and lots of other cognitive and behavioral stuff going on. So skydiving saved my life and my science saved my life. And that's not an overstatement. I love this. And I love the metaphor that it is. Because I don't think there could possibly be in my brain right now any better way to describe every single day of our lives. You literally have the choice. You are hurtling towards death whether you want it or not, right? Every single one of us is. We don't know when the last moment is going to be. You have the choice. You have that 27 seconds. You are the one that is solely responsible. And if you aren't willing to do anything, that's a choice. Maybe not a good one, but still a choice. I absolutely love you have blown my mind with this. I'm going to be obsessed with this thought process for days. Well, if you don't actively make a choice, life is still going on around you and life will make your choices for you. Mm, Truth. Oh, my gosh. I think people who are listening to this podcast are probably like going back and listening to that again, because this is just so good. I do want to ask you a couple of questions, though, because we are running out of time. So you have this book. You have created Your Life Lived Well. Do you want to explain to people how that happened and what exactly that is? Because I think most of us have an idea of what a well-lived life is, but I think what we think it is and what it actually is are two very different things a lot of the time. Yeah, that's really the case. So to condense it down here, I've one of the questions that as a researcher I have focused on since the 90s was this why do some people succeed or fail under difficult circumstances? Mm-hmm. And then in the last decade or so that's kind of morphed into the question how can we still live well even when we're stuck with something really bad that we can never get away from? like a chronic illness. Sure. And so in, in my work, what I'm interested in is I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. 
And so I'm the wrong kind of doctor <laughs> to contribute to a, a medical cure. But what I was interested in was we know from the research that two thirds of health outcomes actually stem from our cognitive and behavioral and social and a little bit of environmental factors. And those are all things that we can do something about. Right. Those are all things that we can express our agency over. And even more important than, than that, you know, there's some ways that I will never be completely healthy because, you know, my, my central nervous system is getting be. eaten away. Right. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I can't do everything else to improve not just my health, but my quality of life. Mm. Because we live at the level of experience, right? And, and I want to experience a good life. And what do I mean by that? Well, the research actually tells us that too. And, and you know, I spent a decade on this. And I've, I've interviewed hundreds, I've surveyed thousands, I've collected millions of data points, did meta-analyses across thousands of studies. I mean, I'm an obsessive researcher. <laughs> and, and, and what they tell us is, if you want to live a good life, then you have to collect experiences that provide you six values. Do you feel happy, satisfied, functional, engaged, meaningful, and secure? You don't need all those at the same time. You don't need them in any particular order. You need to revisit those regularly. And so what I'm interested in is providing the social and behavioral and cognitive tools that will help you gather those kinds of experiences for your life. And what's really important here is this is not a system. This is not a, you know, whatever. I'm not a guru. Okay. I don't believe in that stuff. That that stuff really actually kind of bugs me. What I, what I can do is I can tell you there are 150 different ways to change a behavior, for example. Mm. All of them will work for someone. Only some of them will work for you. Right. And the ones that work for you right now won't work for you in six months or six years. Mm. So what I'm interested in doing is giving you the tools that you can use in your own life to make the decisions that are going to make the most sense for you. I love because that. again, it's all about you and it's right. all about your life lived well. And it's all about you choosing life, not just once, but continuing to choose life and being resilient and continuing to choose life even when things are looking pretty awful. I love this. And I love that you touched on the fact that what works for you now might not in six months, because I think what often happens, especially when I'm talking to my clients is they will say, but this has worked. Meditation worked for me for six years. And then the pandemic hit. Well, let's be frank. The world changed. Lots of things happened. It is understandable that the coping mechanism you had stopped working. We need to find different ones because as we grow and change, as the world evolves around us, we have to adapt to those things and the same things may not work all the time. Exactly. We, we are, humans are always learning. And another word for learning is adaptation. We are always adapting physically. We are always adapting cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally. Our relationships are always adapting. Life is flux. And once we get to, you know, we can have this treasured goal and that, that we have always wanted to get to. And once we get there, well, it's, we're going to find out eventually that it, it was cool, but it's not all that and, it's, and a bag of chips. And uh, we find that we have... We're getting a little bored or we're getting a little dissatisfied. And that's good because satisfied is a is a is a, a way station. We need to have those satisfying periods because they give us the opportunity to rest and relax and recover and right. be at home. Right. But we can't live there because we would die. 
we would spend the rest of our lives sitting on the couch with a bag of chips. Right. Watching Netflix. <laughs> and that's not what we want to do with right. all of our lives. Oh, I absolutely love this conversation. I do want to be respectful of your time, though, because we are running out. And I typically end the podcast by asking a few questions. So before I do that, I will let everyone who's listening know I will put in the show notes all of the links so that they can follow you, they can find you, they can get the book, they can do all the fun stuff. But before I do that, well, I guess I just did that. So I do want to ask you a couple of questions because the listeners tend to really love to use these questions as catalysts in their life. And I think you're going to have some great answers because I think everything you've given me during this conversation has just been fantastic. And I, I could probably talk to you for like another four hours. So I will try not to do that. But I do want to ask you the, the very first question is what inspires you? Wow. You know, the thing that inspires me, I'm, I'm an inveterate people watcher. I, I, you know, as you can probably guess, I, I love watching people. And, and so the thing that, that inspires me is I love watching people when they are performing well. And, and that's everywhere. That's everywhere around us. I remember you know, years ago when I was, a, I was a professor at another university 20 years ago, there was a you know, every Wednesday morning, the, there was the garbage truck would come by and pick up the garbage. And I would stand in the big picture window at the house and look down onto the street. And there was a man who, you know, he was probably in his 50s at the time. And he moved with such a, a beautiful precision and ease. He did something so mundane as collecting the garbage. And, and he did it in a way that was so practiced and so beautiful to watch. And, and I know that his peers thought that too, because he, there would always be someone new there with him that he was training in, in how to do this. And so, so I love, I am inspired when I see someone doing even the most mundane thing with, with this, this joy and, and skill, and you see them engaged in the world and, and really participating. And, Mm -hmm. and I, I am reminded when I see that that we can find those moments anywhere. Mm. And, and so that's really cool. And Ugh. I love that. I see people that, that are like that with stuff that I never thought twice about. You know, I, I love that we live in a world where there are other people who have really thought deeply about that thing and have really learned to do that thing that I completely took for granted. <laughs> well, how cool that's, is that? That's amazing. I love that. And it's so true because there are so many things that just as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I just, you know, I do it and don't think twice about it. But then when I stop to actually think about it, I know people who take their time, who are gentle and delicate or whatever it happens to be with the thing. And I'm like, that is like magical. There is this level that they have that, oh, I love that answer. I love that answer. The Thank next question. Cool. Humans are cool and I'm totally obsessed. And anyone who listens to this podcast knows I got my BA in psychology. And so I am very much a people watcher. And so everybody who listens to this podcast knows part of the reason why I love doing this is because I get to people watch and I get to people watch in a different way with the podcast than you do in real life. And it's just, oh, yes. Anyway, (laughs) the next question before I get too sidetracked is if you could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it be? (laughs) Well, the facetious answer is don't marry redheads. (laughs) 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 But, but, but now in all seriousness, the, the thing that I wish I could have come to grips with earlier in my life is just be kinder to yourself. Mm. 
it, it took me so long to really internalize that message. And I don't mean on a sur- superficial, oh yeah, I know that sure. level, because we all know that. Right. What I mean is the deep understanding and the deep experience of doing it and living it well. And, and just this idea that I deserve to give myself grace, mm-hmm. to understand that, yeah, I'm trying, trying and I'm failing. And, and that's to be expected at the edge, right? That's, sure. that's going to happen sometimes. That's part of growth. And, and so just be kinder, not nicer. Because kind is honest. Kind is sometimes difficult. Sure. Kind always requires some level of sacrifice. But be kind. And and that that's what I would tell myself. Oh. Everything else is. I mean, I, I I might I might have told myself to like you know hang on to that Apple stock through the nineties <laughs> uh, because it is actually going to bounce back. But. Sure, I think you know realistically, all of us would have one of those thoughts, like invest in Tesla or something like that. But um, yep. I love I love your actual answer because I think a lot of people can relate to that, and I think the older you get, the more you sort of have those moments of, I wish I had been this way younger. So Mm -hmm. I love that that's your answer. The next question is, if you could have a conversation with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. There are so many people. I play this game with myself often. Um, Here's one person. I mean, just literally one out of a list. And do you know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was? No. Okay. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a minister. And he was German. And uh, he was he, he wrote his letters and papers from prison and uh, you know a couple of other books. And and so he's he's a German theologian. And during the 30s. He was in the United States, young man, uh, studying at Union Theological Seminary when Hitler came to power. And wow. he decided that it was his responsibility. So he's safe in the United States right now. And he decided to go back to Germany and lead his flock and be an example. and. So I'll I'll finish the rest of his story in a second. But along about the time I first started having symptoms of MS, I I had the opportunity. So I'm a college student. I'm about to do this new tutorial that had been a new tutorial that was offered on ethics, Marxism, and totalitarianism. And it turned out that Renata and Eberhard Betke, now Eberhard Betke, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's best friend. And Renato was his cousin, and they married one another. And Dietrich was his uh, his biographer and edited his stuff after, after he died. And they came to my college to speak. And the professor that was going to do this new tutorial that I was going to be the guinea pig of arranged for the four of us to have a private dinner. Oh my gosh. That night. Now, what you have to understand is that Bonhoeffer was part of that cabal that tried to assassinate Hitler. Wow. So, so here's a man who was safe, who came back, who saw the evil, and who agonized, and we see this in his writings, who agonized with the moral dilemma of how can I be involved in what is demonstrably a bad thing? And how is that ever good or justified? Mm. And he did. So, I mean, you know, he really uh, wore with us. So, 
So Bonhoeffer was put in prison. And at the end of World War II, as the Allies were approaching, shortly before Hitler decided to commit suicide, he ordered everyone else in that prison released and Bonhoeffer taken out and shot. Wow. So I got to spend this evening with, you know, and, and Betke was part of that uh, cabal also. And, uh, but he was peripheral to it. So, you know, he wasn't like an important figure to get. So I got to spend this evening as a young man with, with these two people who were at the center of resistance to Hitler. And, and it was such a powerful, life-changing experience to have. And, and, you know, I am the only one of those four people in that evening now who's still living. And, and I often think, you know, there are sometimes these really profound moments that we have in our lives. And we come to a place, if we live long enough, that we are now the only bearer mm -hmm. of that, that beautiful experience. Yes. And, and so I know that I was so profoundly changed by, by spending an evening with, with these two people who were one degree removed right. from this guy. And, and I'm not a religious person either, but, but I profoundly appreciate and respect the, the depth of his moral fortitude mm -hmm. and, and his practical commitment. And, and so, yeah, if I were to choose one person, he would be high on my list. Definitely. Oh, I love, first of all, that you brought it up because I didn't even know about him, but now I'm like, I'll put him on my list. Cause I have questions. I want to know things. I love this. And just the experience that you talked about, I think, oh, my mind is blown right now because I think we do often when we have those moments, we can appreciate them in the moment, but it's not until much later, as you said, when you realize I am the only one left that has ever experienced this. I am the only one with these stories. I am like, there are so many people in the world right now who are slowly dying off because they're getting to be that age that have stories from way back then that never spoke of them and people never got to hear how they viewed it, how they lived it, how they experienced it, how they survived it all. And we're losing some of that too, which I think is so transformational for us as humans. And the greatest thing about that evening is we had this wonderful dinner and it was in this, this private room and there was a piano there. So Renata sat down at the piano and then we took turns at the piano and we had this sing along oh for like an hour afterward. And it was, it was, it was just such a wonderful human experience. Oh God. I love that. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that because I think everyone who is listening to this is going to appreciate that so much. The last question I'm going to ask you, because I know we are running out of time. The last question is the one that I love asking the most. It is what does happiness mean to you? Ooh. Wow, that's it. <clears throat> and and I talk about this is actually in chapter thirteen of my book. Uh, and and one of the things I uh, let me come at this sideways. Happiness and joy are two different things. Mm. And and sometimes we we mistake joy for happiness. And and they're both great experiences, but joy is fundamentally surprise. Okay. Joy is always a surprise. And, and of course, C.S. Lewis's wonderful uh, autobiography, Surprised by Joy. And, right. and, and uh, speaking of another religious figure <laughs> from the same time as Bonhoeffer, and, and I'm quoting a lot of religious guys for some guy who's not <laughs> religious himself, but uh, nevertheless, uh, joy. If we expect happiness to be joy, we're going to be disappointed mm -hmm. because, because joy is actually tied to that acute stress response. 
really. It is right. because we start getting that little, we start getting that little, and then the surprise happens. And what happens is it turns out to be a happy surprise. It's not a, a scary surprise. Right. And that's joy. That's that catharsis, that release of, wow. So happiness is a quieter sensation than joy. And I think true happiness, we, we can come to overlook or discount when it's in front of us because we're expecting the fireworks of joy. Right. And, and joy is really cool and we want joy, but we can't live in joy. Uh, and, and, and happiness, happiness is quieter, but, but happiness is no less good. And, and happiness can't be there all the time because we understand the world in relief and we really have to do, we have to have the negative experiences to, to enjoy and appreciate fully the positive experiences. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would say, how do I define happiness? Happiness is that quieter, pleasing, not joyful, but satisfying, warm emotion that, that we just kind of want to hang out in and, and savor and, and don't try to hang on to it. It's like, mm. it's like a skittish little puppy. <laughs> you know, in, in, enjoy it while it's there, appreciate it while it's there, and then let it go because oh. it will come back around. I love that. This has been, I have to tell you, probably the best conversation I've had in ages. I absolutely adore you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I know I've kept you over the time that I told you I would keep you, but this has been fabulous. I cannot thank you enough. I, I have truly enjoyed it, Crystal, and and I thank you so much for what you're doing with your podcast. I, I do appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who is listening. I will post, as I said, in the show notes, all of the things, social media, websites, all the fun stuff so that you can get in touch. You can follow. You can see what Kevin is up to. Maybe you can skydive too, you know, whatever works for you. I hey, hope- come on out. Hit me up. <laughs> I hope you guys have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I appreciate that you keep coming back week after week to the podcast six years into this thing. And I still can't believe that I get to do this. So thank you so much. I hope you all have an amazing and wonderful week. And I thank you for listening since we went super long today. I cannot thank you enough, Kevin. I cannot thank the listeners enough. This has been fabulous. And I hope everybody has a wonderful week. We will chat with you next week. Bye for now.